push this here. Thank you, Dorina, very much. And um, I'm very uh, pleased to, to be here and to talk to you about gender and security. Um, now, gender and security, this is a vast topic, and uh, 60 minutes is hardly enough to do really justice to the topic as such. Um, and it might mean that, uh, you know, the next hour is a little bit less interactive as I would have liked. Uh, but I hope that at the end of these 60 minutes, um, I have spurred your interest in four main arguments that I would like to make. Uh, the first argument I'd like to make is that the nature of our security problems is highly gendered. The security environment that we're facing today, be it in Africa, in Europe, in Asia, or in the United States, is a very complex environment. It involves multiple issues and multiple actors. And the way we think about these security challenges, as well as the nature of these security challenges, is, I would argue, highly gendered. Take, for instance, you know, the issue that is the, uh, one of the, the key challenges uh, today that has to do with terrorism and violent extremism, and see how groups like ISIS or Boko Haram <laughs> are using gender norms to advance their causes uh, by luring young boys through idealized notions of hypermasculinity and young women through idealized notions of femininity. Unfortunately, we often fail to recognize these gender dimensions of our security predicaments. And as a result, I would argue our policy responses keep failing. Sustainable peace and security requires that we use a gender lens for the analysis of our security problems. It also requires the involvement of all men and women. The second argument I'd like to make is that gender is not another word for women. Gender is about the socially constructed roles assigned to both men and women in societies. It is about the relationship between them and the differences in power between them. Uh, ultimately, gender is really all about power dynamics. Now, gender norms and power dynamics in societies are not static. They change over time, particularly in conflict. And in conflict, we often see sort of two things happening at the same time. On the one hand, um, we see a sort of reinforcement of very stereotypical notions of what it means to be a man or a woman. Uh, we see sort of glorification of masculinity uh, and hypermasculinity. Um, and at the same time, we also see a change in traditional gender roles where women would become providers and move into positions of power. Now, while in many cases when we talk about gender and gender inequality, we often talk about women. And the reason is that uh, gender inequalities disadvantage females, women, more than others. But I think it is important to realize that gender norms and policies may also negatively affect boys and men. The third argument I'd like to make is that when you're thinking about military operations, you better be thinking gender as well. Uh, it will increase your operational effectiveness. And I will talk a little bit later about a project uh, that we are doing uh, with the help of NATO that um, looks at how gender is being integrated in military operations. The fourth argument I'd like to leave you with is that has to do with sexual violence. Uh, sexual violence as a tactic of war. Uh, sexual violence can and must be stopped. It is not inevitable, and it has nothing to do with sex, but all with gender power dynamics. So those are the four main arguments I'm going to, to talk about.
But before we delve into the specifics, I'd like to ask, you know, who has heard about 1325? And does anybody know what 1325 stands for? Can I ask you what you think it stands for? from Uganda. It's a United Nations Security Council Resolution 1325. We normally group it together with the 1820 and the Goma Declaration, and it's about women empowerment, and it's a, it it is about the gender-based violence. Uh, it uh, protects. Uh, gender, I would say gender, not women, men and men, mostly in conflict areas. And uh, it has been demonstrated uh, down to Africa and then the, the different countries. Africa, we have the African gender policy, which was got from that. And then the different countries also have got their national gender policies. And we normally have the, 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 not the national action plans, which we implement. Okay, we'll, we'll come back to 1325. I think uh, you're totally correct. Uh, just for the others, though, who seem not to have um, heard so much about 1325, this was indeed a resolution adopted by the UN Security Council now some 15 years ago. And uh, I would argue, you know, at this point in stage, there, there are two sort of main ideas behind this r resolution. Uh, one is the gendered nature of security problems. Uh, and that means the different impact war and security has on women and men. And second, that, uh, as you mentioned, that women need to be empowered in the sense that women need to be involved as well in the resolution and prevention of violent conflict. But I'll come back to 1325. I would like to start off our discussion on gender and security uh, to uh, touch upon three issues. First of all, I'd like to talk a little bit more about what I mean when I say that uh, security challenges are gendered. Second, I want to come back to 1325, and particularly what 1325 means for you, military leaders. And then third, I want to talk a little bit about sexual violence in war uh, and share some of the findings of um, a network that we have that looks, uh, that studies uh, sexual violence in, in, in war and also deals with, uh, helps survivors deal with this type of violence. Now, when I say that uh, security challenges, you know, the security challenges that we are facing uh, are gendered, and when I think about the security challenges that we are facing, you know, be it here in Europe or in Africa, I basically see four main security challenges. <clears throat> there are challenges that have to do with people, challenges that have to do with economic development, challenges that have to do with governance issues, and then lastly, challenges that have to do with physical security issues with violent conflict and potential violent conflict. Now, I argue that all these security challenges are highly gendered. That means they impact men and women differently. And hence, our policy responses need to be attentive to that. So just think about it, the people challenge. What the people challenge is basically about population growth, where that growth happens, about the distribution of people in terms of age and gender, and it's about the movement of people, refugee flows. And in all these dimensions of the people challenge, gender matters a great deal. The second challenge has to do with economics, economic development. Uh, I think we all agree that economic development is key for stable societies, for peace and security. And this September, the UN General Assembly will adopt the 2030 Sustainable Development Goals. Uh, 
the text of which was finalized just this last Saturday. Now, this new 2030 agenda not only recognizes that gender equality and the empowerment of women and girls will make a crucial contribution to all the 17 goals that were identified, but it also singles out gender equality and the empowerment of women as a separate standalone goal um, for development. It's goal number five, which is all about achieving gender equality and empowering women and girls by 2030. The third challenge we face, I think, has to do with governance. And that is governance, you know, be it at a global level, at a regional, national, or local level. I would argue that at all three levels, uh, we have huge governance and legitimacy deficits. And that is true both for the global north as well as for the global south. I think all over in the world, people feel that the states and the policymakers um, are not representing uh, their interest. And what we see, too, in all of these governance structures is that women are highly underrepresented. Now, I think if we can't figure out this governance challenge, we are in big trouble. Uh, we all know that fragile states and ungoverned spaces quickly become safe havens for criminal groups, networks, extremists. And so I think we need to figure out how to create representative, transparent, non-corrupt governance structures that are based on the rule of law and that allow everybody in society, men and women, to have a voice. Now, the first challenge, the, the fourth challenge has to do with security, and that is physical security. Security from fear, security from violent conflict. And, you know, some would say security encompasses all these challenges that you have mentioned. And I would agree to a large extent. But even if we define security in very narrow terms as meaning physical security, uh, then, too, the gender dimensions are huge. And I would say the gender dimensions are huge, both in terms of causes and in terms of impacts. Now, in general, when we think about the causes of war, we generally think in terms of resources, power struggles, ethnicity, religious strife, or a mixture of all of those. But recent research has also pointed to the role of gender inequality and inequity as a cause of violence and violent behavior not just by individuals, but by states as well. And it's a very interesting little footnote to see in this regard that to look at the status of women and the sort of foreign policy of states. And it's interesting to note that the status of women uh, in countries like Russia and China is actually degreasing, is uh, regressing, uh, and seems to coincide also with a more assertive and aggressive stance of those, uh, of those countries. Now, I'm not saying that there is a causal relationship, but I think what I'm saying is there is a very strong correlation between the two. Now, the gender dimensions of war in terms of impact, uh, I think, are obvious. Uh, the impact of war on people, that is men and women, uh, is clear. And it is clear that these impacts are different depending on whether you are a man or a woman. And that is really what UN Security Resolution 1325 was all about. So this brings me to the second point, and that is UN Security Council Resolution 1325. The first time that people started to realize that um, gender matters when you're dealing with peace and security issues uh, was in 1995, 
with the fourth UN World Conference on Women that took place in Beijing. It was then at the first time really that an international gathering saw women not just as victims of war, but also as potential agents of change. And this Beijing 1995 conference ultimately led to the adoption in 2000 of UN Security Council Resolution 1325. And with this resolution, member states of the UN Security Council Resolution recognized that women are inordinately affected by conflict that they have a critical role to play in the ending of wars, and that without them, no peace is sustainable. And this was then the launch of what we now call the Women, Peace and Security Agenda. Now, as you mentioned, since 2000, 2000, much has happened. The UN Security Council has adopted six more resolutions on this particular agenda, including resolution 1820 that was adopted in 2008 and which dealt specifically with sexual violence in conflict. And in 2009, it appointed a special representative of the UN Secretary General for sexual violence in conflict. Uh, this post is currently uh, held by Zainab Bangura of Sierra Leone. As you mentioned also, uh, states have adopted national action plans to implement uh, this resolution. And currently there are some 50 states that have adopted national action plans. Uh, there are 15 African states that have adopted uh, national action plans or NAPs as we like to call them. Um, Regional organizations, including military organizations like NATO, have adopted and appointed uh, special envoys, elaborated plans, and military directives. And in this regard, I'd like to flag NATO's by strategic directive 40 1 that was first adopted in 2009 and updated in 2012, and that has recognized gender equality as a strategic strategic goal of the organization. The North Atlantic Council, which is the highest political organ of NATO, at its summit in 2014, acknowledged that, and I quote, the integration of a gender perspective into alliance activities throughout NATO's three core tasks, that means collective defense, crisis management, and cooperative security, will contribute to a more modern, ready, and responsive NATO. The AU has adopted, as you mentioned also, a, in 2009, a gender uh, policy. It proclaimed 2010-2020 the Africa Women's Decade. Uh, this year is actually the AU's year of the empowerment of women. Um, and in 2014, the AU appointed a special envoy for women, peace and security, Bineta Diop. Um, the AU has also established civilian protection and gender units in field missions and um, has been going quite far in the integration of gender in its operation. Now, currently at the UN, as we are gearing up for the 15th anniversary of UN Security Council Resolution 1325, uh, there is a global review on how states are implementing uh, UN Security Council Resolution 1325. And a study on this implementation will be presented to the UN Security Council later this year. <clears throat> now, the results are not yet public. Um, but it is clear that actually a lot of progress has been made, particularly at the rhetorical level. Uh, unfortunately, though, at the implementation level, uh, things are a little bit more problematic. There was a um, 
recent NATO review of operations of NATO in Afghanistan and Kosovo. NATO has been far out in terms of its, of its documents. Uh, and it showed that actually many soldiers did not know about UN Security Council Resolution 1325. Most thought that this was a new beer that was maybe being put on the market by the French. Um, and for many, gender remained a very abstract concept. There's a recent panel by the UN on peace operations uh, that recently concluded its study of peace operations. And it also um, had less than favorable conclusions when it comes to gender. Uh, it noted that gender is often not taken into account when the UN Secretariat plans and designs a field mission. That the commitment to the Women, Peace and Security agenda at the highest levels uh, is not very <clears throat> consistent. And that the integration of gender throughout mission activities uh, are limited. There's also, it was also pointed out that oftentimes there's a lack of understanding and attention to gender issues by mission leadership. Uh, and of course, the council itself, the Security Council itself, will often put language in its resolutions when it uh, deploys new missions. But it is very uh, slow and uh, lacks initiatives in the follow-up of its own commitments, uh, particularly in particular uh, country-specific contexts. So I would argue that for many policymakers and military leaders, uh, 1325 and the Women, Peace and Security Agenda is limited to, oh yes, let's think about it, let's add some more women. And that was that they have uh, dealt with, with this issue. But adding more women is only half of what UN Security Council Resolution 1325 was trying to do. And the way to think about this is that there are two main sort of ideas at the heart of UN Security Council Resolution 1325. And they have to do with gender balancing and gender mainstreaming. Now, gender balancing has to do with equal rights and rebalancing the number of women and men engaged in international peace and security policies. Uh, and under this idea, we stress the idea of equal participation, full involvement, uh, and increasing the numbers of women, particularly in the security sector. Now, gender mainstreaming is something different. Gender mainstreaming is really a strategy to achieve gender equality by assessing the implications for both men and women of any planned action. This can be legislation, it can be a policy, it can be a program, or it can be a military operation. You want to gender mainstream that it that means you want to assess the implications for the people on the ground, that means for both men and women, when you design, implement, and evaluate your policy programs or operations. So gender mainstreaming is a process, is a process that recognizes and incorporates the role of gender in relation to your actions, to your missions. And gender mainstreaming doesn't focus just on women. Um, the thing is that the benefits of mainstreaming often recognize that uh, the disadvantaged positions uh, are held by women, and hence the focus will be on women. But gender mainstreaming as such uh, is not necessarily just restricted to women. Ultimately, when we have a gender perspective, that means that we have a people perspective. Uh, that we put people, men, women, boys, girls, and their critical vulnerabilities at the center. Uh, 
And so for military personnel, when you're on a peace mission, this means asking questions such as, who am I talking to? Why am I talking to these persons? Why am I not talking to other persons? Who do I invite? Who is present? What effect do my action have on men, women, boys, and girls? Are these effects the same or are they different? What are the second and third order implications? When you go on patrol, do you know who you're going to encounter and why? How to get better intelligence on the societal dynamics in an area that you're operating in? Are you, a male soldier, the best interlocutor for people in a village, a town, or a ministry? You know, it requires you to think about who your interlocutors are. Who provides you with intelligence? Do you collect data? Do you collect data on your area of operation? And is this data sex disaggregated? Who do, ne do you negotiate with for temporary passage? What effect does this have? Who do you protect and why? Are you aware of the conditions of access to humanitarian and health resources? Are there differences in the population, et cetera, et cetera? Uh, the same goes through for disarmament, demobilization, demobilization repatriation uh, programs uh, with sexual violence and gender-based violence. Um, with knowing who's involved in negotiating and mediating efforts, et cetera. So it's at every step of the way, be cognizant of who you're talking to, whether this is a man and a woman, and why are you talking to this particular person? I think if you want to summarize it, military actors, when they intervene in conflict or post-conflict situations, uh, need to be aware of these gendered dynamics in societies, and they need to understand how conflict impacts different genders, <coughs> how conflict has changed gender roles and the responsibilities of men and women, how different kinds of violence affect men and women differently, what the different needs are of people, and how your own action may advance or set back uh, an agenda of gender equality. Now, as I said before, I'm currently developing, uh, with the support of NATO, a scorecard uh, on 1325 for military operations. And this scorecard is basically a methodology that allows to assess how member states and partner states of NATO are integrating these principles of UN Security 1325 into their military operations. How well are they doing gender mainstreaming? How well are they doing gender balancing? And how well do they deal with sexual and gender-based violence? And what we find is that there are two very important indicators that show whether military uh, understand what the principles of 1325 mean in their operations. Uh, one, you know, it's kind of an obvious one, and that is training. Uh, you know, helping you understand your soldiers. Um, have that state of mind of thinking of people in, in, a, in a holistic and comprehensive ways. And that this gender training has to happen not only at a high level, at the level you are at, but also at a mid-level and at a junior level. And the other most important indicator is whether a gender advisor is appointed at the commander staff. Once that happens, then actually everything will trickle down. And I can, we can talk some more about the scorecard if you want later, because it has, I think, implications not just for NATO military, but for uh, military in the world 
So the last point I wanted to talk about is sexual violence. Um, sexual violence became a big issue in the 1325 discussions. And in recent years, when uh, we're talking about 1325, it was almost as if the only thing we were talking about was the issue of sexual violence at the expense of the uh, participation of women at the negotiating table. Um, but it's important to look at sexual violence because it is, again, I think, a, a very good example of why a gendered framework is necessary to fully understand what is going on. Uh, I think, and I want to be brief here, but I think there are a number of misconceptions about sexual violence in war. And for me, there are five misconceptions and myths that really stand out. The first is that rape in war is inevitable. It's the sort of testosterone argument. You know, boys will be boys. Men have uncontrollable sexual desires that can only be kept in check by learned societal norms. And during wars, those norms break down and men revert to a state of nature. Now, I think it's, uh, you know, paying uh, not a lot of respect to a lot of men uh, anywhere in the world. In addition, uh, research has shown that there is great variation in conflict-related sexual violence. And even within some conflicts, some groups may revert to sexual violence while others will not in the same conflict. So there's a lot of variation, and we actually know very little still about why that variation happens. The second myth and misconception is that sexual violence only affects women. And we know that is not true. Men and boys are also victims of rape. Yet, because we don't have a gender perspective, we never ask the question. Um, and it is an example of why gender uh, must be an inclusive analytical tool focused not just on one sex, but on both. And we also know that uh, some women have resorted to sexual violence. The third misconception is uh, sexual violence as a strategy or a tactic of war. Now, this is sometimes the case, and I think uh, one can make the argument that groups like ISIS or Boko Haram uh, definitely use sexual violence as a strategy uh, of their um, of their actions, but oftentimes. Um, it's not a strategy, um, but an expression of dominance and power, and it is something that is condoned, um, that is sort of accepted, but not necessarily, uh, not necessarily a strategy of war that is being directed from the top. The fourth misconception, I think, is the fact that um, for many people, and I think um, they think that sexual violence is mostly an African problem. And, you know, we all know the DRC and Rwanda, the problem of sexual and gender based violence is horrific. However, we also know that rape happened in Europe, in the Balkans, and in Asia. And some of the U.S. State Department data actually suggest that rape was more prevalent in the Balkans between 1980 and 2009 than in Africa. The other issue is that, of course, sexual violence and gender-based violence is a huge problem within the military. And the military, I would argue, everywhere in the world. Um, the U.S. military has a huge problem with sexual assault and abuse. Uh, European military have similar problems. 
And I would suspect that that type of problem exists in your military as well. The fifth myth is that sexual violence is increasing. And actually, we do not know whether that is true because we have very poor data. So I think to really deal with the actual, with the issue of sexual violence, uh, we need to examine the causes of such violence and we need to look at the gendered nature of our institutions and structures. And our, in our responses to sexual violence and gender-based violence, we often like to take shortcuts. And I think uh, this is particularly true for uh, the issue of sexual violence. So to sum up um, and to give us some time for some Q&A, uh, four points. First, I think it is important to recognize that the impetus for the adoption of UN Security Council Resolution 1325 had nothing to do with women, actually. Um, and some could even say it had nothing to do with gender. It really was about how best to establish and maintain international peace and security. And we realized that the absence of a gender lens um, made us failing in this particular uh, arena. The second is that, um, you know, gender does not equal women. Gender is about these socially constructed and assigned roles, roles that change over time. Third is that I think we've made a lot of progress in this arena on the women, peace, and security agenda. Uh, many policy documents will contain language related to gender mainstreaming, uh, women's empowerment, uh, including, I think, the AU has been very in advance in this arena. Unfortunately, implementation is lacking. And we're far from having attained women empowerment or gender equality. Yet I think they are really the key to peace and security uh, in the 21st century. And for the military, the principles, the implementation of the principles of 1325 require three things. First, it requires that you adopt a gender perspective when you're planning for a mission, when you execute a mission, and when you train for a mission, including in mission training. A gender perspective should be present in your concept of operations in your campaign plans, in your operation orders, in your directives on the use of force, etc. The second thing that is very important for the military, I think, is that it requires you to think about the presence and the role of women in the security forces. And when I say the security forces, I would include not just the military, but also the gendarmerie and the police. And the third important thing when you're thinking about as a military, how do I implement the principles of 1325 in my operation, is the issue of zero tolerance for sexual exploitation and abuse. Now, the last point has to do with uh, sexual violence. And you know, another way to think about sexual violence, um, the way people think about sexual violence often is, you know, it's either a horrible crime that is committed by some bad individuals, uh, or it is a weapon or tactic of war, or it can be seen as a symptom and a manifestation of dominance and patterns of dominance within society. Now, if you see sexual violence as a horrible crime or a weapon of war, maybe it's enough that uh, you make sure that people who do this get punished, uh, be put into jail, 
and that victims and survivors are being taken care of uh, at a psychological and medical level. And a lot what we have focused on in the international arena has focused on sort of dealing with the symptom. Make sure that all women, men, boys, girls have equal rights, equal opportunities to capital, to land, um, and other opportunities. Sexual violence is a key indicator of gender inequality in a society. And what we now know of an increasing body of research is that states with higher gender inequities and inequalities take part more often in violence, initiate aggression in disputes with neighboring states than more equitable, gender equitable states. And so with that, I would like to uh, open it up for um, discussion and Q&A. Thank you.